So last week, you heard about the perceptron. No, not about the perceptron. You heard about logistic regression, which is uh, one way of uh, instantiating a perceptron, except that uh, machine learning people have been uh, much better at marketing. And uh, perceptron, I think, sounds cooler than logistic regression. Um, so the name itself, it evokes uh, you know, perception. And this is uh, what, what people, when they were working on this first in the, in the 60s, uh, what they had in mind uh, to create uh, thinking machines. And uh, they, they built a device uh, that could, given some input, learn something. It was an analog device. I will tell you about it uh, another time. Uh, but they coined this uh, perceptron. And uh, well, the, in Celico versions of this, uh, they live on uh, until today, except that nowadays uh, we combine millions and billions of them into into deep neural networks. Uh, but first things first, we will start with the perceptron today, uh, then uh, discuss how to stack them into more complicated machines, uh, so-called multi-layer perceptrons. And uh, then next week, we will talk about uh, convolutional networks. Not next week, on Wednesday. We'll talk about convolutional networks and such. All right, the perceptron first. And uh, so it is a... Um, device, if we're given features x1, x2, um, and we have uh, exemplars from uh, two classes. Let's say there is a positive class, and there is a negative class. And we want to somehow um, discriminate them, so we'll have a decision boundary, uh, say like that. And already when we were discussing uh, regression, uh, I did not want to have a representation with a slope and an intercept. Uh, instead, I wanted something that makes uh, the formula simpler. Yeah? So uh, we were already then working in uh, so-called homogeneous coordinates. And uh, in one of the exercises, you explored the difference a little bit. Yeah? So also today, um, we will work in homogeneous coordinates. Which means that we absorb the intercept in just yet another dimension um, of our parameter vector. So I could write here um, that this has uh, a normal vector, uh, W tilde. And I could say that uh, W tilde transpose X tilde is minus B. And I'm, I'm putting these tildes everywhere now just so that later on I can omit them and make my life a bit easier. Uh, and so what, what does it mean? Uh, if you consider this uh, parallel line here, um, then uh, which has the same normal vector, W tilde, uh, then all vectors x which lie on this line here, so, so all points uh, on this line, this one or that one or that one, um, all these vectors, um, they are all orthogonal to this uh, normal vector, W tilde. So hence, uh, for this line here, I would have that W tilde transpose X tilde is zero. But now, if I don't want this to be, uh, if I don't want it to go through the origin, but I want it to have some, uh, some distance here, uh, then, well, I can measure this distance here uh, by B. And if a uh, normal vector uh, W tilde, if it has a, a length of 1, then this distance here would really be precisely B. Okay? So um, writing this out here, this would be like W1 tilde, X1 tilde, plus W tilde, X2 tilde, 
plus my intercept by my distance to the origin uh, times 1 equals 0. And I'm now creating a new vector and new explanatory variables x1, x2, and x1, uh, and just one, like so. And then I'm going to abbreviate this whole thing as w transpose x equals 0. Okay, so this homogeneous coordinates just means that we augment our, um, we augment our vector here of explanatory variables by an extra coefficient or extra constant, just one. Okay, so this is the uh, representation that we're going to use. And now this was already a perfect decision boundary. Um, if I don't give you a uh, perfect decision boundary, but just a decision boundary, then we would like to know uh, what's the number of misclassification or the, what's the error that a particular decision surface is going to make. Yeah, so I I can I can compute the misclassification error just the number of misclassified samples. I'm calling uh, calling it epsilon here. It depends on my parameter vector w. And if I'm uh, assuming that I'm having uh, data consisting of tuples, so I have uh, xi and yi, and uh, I'm assuming here that uh, today these uh, yi, um, they are going to be element of minus 1 plus 1 then I can I can write this error here as the number of samples from the positive class which were misclassified so I'm summing here over all samples I in my trading set for which uh, yi was uh, class plus 1. And then I'm using the indicator, <coughs> indicator function here, which is uh, 1 whenever its argument is true and 0 otherwise. And I'm asking is uh, this inner product here of xi transpose w if it is smaller than 0. So I'm counting the number of samples which lie uh, not in the direction that the normal vector is pointing, but which lie in the other half space. Okay, so I'm counting these, and I'm saying um, these are the ones which are on the wrong side of the decision boundary uh, that belong to the positive class. And then I have a similar expression for the negative class. So here I'm asking, is this inner product larger than zero? And to get a more compact expression, um, you see we have here once we have less than and the other time we have more than. And uh, so I can just write a single expression where I multiply this class label plus one or minus one in there. So now this goes over all samples. And the indicator function asks if yi times xi transpose w if it is less than zero. And if, if y happens to be negative or minus one, then you know this would turn around this uh, sign in the equality here, the inequality. 
good. And another way to write this is uh, to express it in terms of a step function. So I'm using H here for heaviside step function. And now normally the step function is plus one on the, on the right hand side. Um, but now I want to I want to plot the argument. So yi times xi transpose w. Um, I want to plot this on my horizontal axis and say zero is here. And I want to uh, count an error of one whenever I'm on the wrong side of the decision boundary. And more specifically, um, if this is zero, this is just uh, this is fine. But if I get values smaller than zero, then I want to have a value of one here. So this choice of a heavy side step function would be a uh, left continuous. heavy side step function. And now because I'm wanting the step function to be non-zero on the left side and not on the right, this is why I'm putting the minus here. And then writing yi xi transpose w. OK, and, and uh, overall, this measures the number of misclassified samples. Okay, so for so how do we understand this plot? Um, I'm recreating this uh, plot up here. So I would now um, consider each of these uh, observations here and uh, just project them on the normal. And here you see that the, um, let's call this the blue decision boundary here. You see all the samples here end up, uh, all the positive samples end up on this side. Um, all the negative samples uh, end up on, on the other side when I'm projecting here. So in terms of my loss function here, all my positive samples project somewhere on the right-hand side. All the negative samples, because we um, because we multiply with uh, class yi, all the negative samples are also projected on the right-hand side. And so the overall error of this perfect decision boundary was zero. Okay. Let's uh, choose a less trivial example. I'm deleting these projection lines so that it's not quite as messy. Um, Let's create a decision boundary which uh, does have at least one error. Let's say this decision boundary here, the green one, it misclassifies this particular sample here. So if I now um, project onto its normal here, then most of the positive samples end up on the correct side all of the negative samples end up on the correct side, but we have this one mistake here. So in terms of my plot here on the right-hand side, positive examples, most of them ended up on the right-hand side. The negative examples ended up on the right-hand side, but there was one point which was on the wrong side. So this made for a classification error of, of one. All right, now where's the connection with uh, logistic regression and such? Um, the connection is that this heavy side step function 
it's not a very convenient function to work with if we want to optimize these things. So if we want to go from an imperfect decision boundary to a better one. And uh, that's why instead of the step function, I can, for example, use the sigmoid here. <coughs> as I can obtain from logistic regression. Or I could choose to use something like that. This would be called a hinge function. Hinge in German is uh, Scharnier, and uh, you see it, well, it's sort of a hinge because it's linear on both sides and has a hinge, a discontinuity there, or a discontinuity in the first derivative uh, at this point. And, well, this hinge function, uh, if we look at it, um, It does behave differently because the, the misclassification error uh, does not care how far on the wrong side a sample is. If it's a little bit on the wrong side or very far on the wrong side, it doesn't matter. Whereas for the sinh function, uh, the more I'm on the wrong side of the decision boundary, uh, the greater is the, the penalty that I incur. Um, and yet, this has, the hinge function has been super popular in in machine learning, uh, can anyone think of a reason why the hinge function has been so popular? So, so if I wanted to obtain not this misclassification error, uh, but for now let me call it the hinge error. This is not a word that anybody in the community uses, okay? I'm putting it in a quotation mark. So for the hinge error, if I'm calling this function here h, um, I would have a similar expression. Yeah? I would say h uh, epsilon hinge for w. And I'm writing here hinge of minus yi xi transpose w. Uh, can, can anyone imagine why this hinge function would be a popular choice? Yes, please. Maybe you're not interested in, in the small error, so you fill out one deviation. Um, but uh, yeah, huge uh, yeah, discrepancies from from your true value um, will um, yeah give you a, a big uncertainty. Yeah, that's a good that's a good argument. Yeah. So you say if we are marginal on the wrong side, we care much less than if we are very much on the wrong side. That's a good argument. Do you have gradient descent is very easy for linear functions. Gradient descent is very easy. Can you say um, what do you mean by easy? It's correct. So you try to take the gradient on the left side is a constant, on the right side is zero. Yeah, it's easy to compute, I agree. Um, can you say make a qualitative argument? I also think that uh, one of the functions saturates, so you cannot like the gradient becomes very really small. Yeah, for the uh, for the other functions that I plotted here, the gradient saturates, but not for the hinge. That's correct. Uh, what's the consequence of this if we think of it in terms of you know optimi an, of an optimization problem? Yes. I think if you count a bit of gradients and you multiply them, they go to zero. Yeah, we're not multiplying the gradients here. Yeah? We're um, we're adding. Up, yeah, because we get one contribution from each uh, trading sample. In the back, yes. Uh, maybe the decision boundary is more unique. The decision boundary becomes more unique. This is true for the hinge function that I've drawn here, in the following sense that um, um, let's go back to the example up here. Okay, I'm recycling a lot here. Uh, maybe I should have drawn a new one. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm going to draw a new one, okay? It's too messy. 
Um, so the argument was that the hinge function now is more unique, and this is, or the solution is more unique, and that's correct, because if, if I have x1, x2, you know, I have these positive samples and these negative samples, um, then all of this, these blue decision functions, or I should use black to be consistent with my plot, um, all of these black functions here, these decision boundaries, they all have zero misclassification error. Yeah? And uh, if we look at this particular choice of Finch function that I made here, um, we already get a little bit of penalty, even if a sample was on the correct side. But we want it to be you know, on the correct side by at least this margin here. And that makes the solution indeed more unique or less ambiguous. That's the correct statement. Can you give another argument of why the cinch function has been popular in machine learning? Yeah? Okay, you give a biological argument. Um, machine learners only use these biological arguments when they suit them well. <laughs> so, uh, so they invent something and they say, yeah, yeah, it's the same in biology, so it must be, <laughs> it must be true. Um, can can we find another argument? Yes. So you give a numerical argument essentially. Stability. Of, mm -hmm. Okay, um, so there, there is an ar there's another argument and we will come to that, okay? All right, so this has been, uh, so we've discussed so far this misclassification error. Um, and if we now look at this uh, function epsilon of W, this misclassification error, it's a surface, right? As I change my parameters, I move around in this surface. It's called, uh, let's call it here, this uh, loss surface. Loss surface epsilon of W. It's a sum of heavy sidestep function. And each of these functions lies at a different place, right? because these heavy sidestep functions, they have these, um, each one here has a different argument. Um, so it's a sum of Let's add here displaced heavy side step functions. And as such, it is piecewise constant. And it has more informative gradient. This is an argument that you gave. And it has ambiguous local optima is another argument that you gave. Um, and I brought you a, a picture, and this is again in the, in the public document. If you want to copy it. Um, this is an example here. We have uh, a blue class and a red class. And um, I have parametrized this solution in uh, homogeneous coordinates here. 
and these displaced step functions um, they give us something which on the sphere looks like this. Yeah, so I've color coded here this misclassification error and so you see that um, we have uh, actually there are solutions possible which have zero error and uh, all of these solutions which have zero error the, the black ones here um, all of these solutions they reside together in this parameter space in this uh, well, it's very dim uh, in this uh, there's one triangle here and I did not show you the color coding but indeed inside this triangle we have zero error huh? and now you mentioned this ambiguity yeah so uh, let's say this uh, one function which here has the biggest difference from the um, from the blue and the red class probably looks well actually I think it's this one that I already plotted here uh, so this function somehow lies um, smack in the middle of this triangle and uh, these other more extreme functions you know, like this is uh, in the one direction the most extreme function that I can create and that would be in another direction the most uh, extreme function that I can create these most extreme functions um, they uh, define these uh, boundaries of this uh, triangle of, of zero loss and here I've uh, unrolled <coughs> the sphere <coughs> uh, just to give you a you know, cleaner or a clearer view and uh, here you see that uh, indeed the, the smallest error that I can possibly get is zero this is a false color plot uh, and it goes up to 20. Why? Because there are 20 examples. Uh, so if I use the worst possible decision boundary, which uh, is just the, uh, the same as the optimal one, but with normal vector pointing in the other direction, so every decision is wrong, um, then this gives me you know, an error of, of 20. And this corresponds to um, these solutions out here, which in some sense are this mirror image of, uh, of the perfect solutions. Okay. So this is what this um, decision surface looks like. Um, if the data is linearly separable and well, I mean, in two dimensions, we can just look at the data, but in higher dimensions, we will not be able to look at it. Yeah? So we will somehow initialize our decision boundary. Maybe it looks like that. And uh, this point in space, I don't know, perhaps corresponds to this boundary. And now we would like to know in which direction should I move in order to improve. And well, if I don't have informative gradient, I can only, you know, sample a few random solutions and see if maybe one of them gets better. Yeah. Uh, so it is more attractive if I can get a gradient. And indeed, if I use um, I think in this uh, plot in the bottom here, um, I used the sigmoid instead of the heavy side step function. So I used uh, logistic regression. And you see that uh, this smooths out my entire energy surface. And uh, at this point, uh, it does become possible well, I mean, here the gradients are very weak, but they're not strictly zero. But if I'm somewhere, let's say I'm starting here, you know, at a, at a solution which is you know, mildly going in the right direction, then on this type of surface, it's easy to compute a gradient because it's smooth. <coughs> and then I can create a series of models by doing gradient descent until I find one which is best. Okay, this was for a linearly separable example. Now here is one which is not linearly separable. So um, 
we again see a collection of uh, blue and red points, two different classes, and you see that there is no perfect linear decision boundary. So whatever I'm doing, I'm going to misclassify you know, at least two samples here. Ooh, this is almost linear. So um, let's look at uh, this, at its arrow surface. Again, unrolled here. And here we see a new feature, namely, not only is it piecewise constant, but um, it even has distinct local minima. So I see a distinct local, sorry, the contrast here for you is not fantastic, but you know, there is a local optimum here, there's a local optimum there, and it's difficult for you to see. There are, in fact, uh, a few more tiny local optima, like there, there, and there. Let's see if we can understand these. So, this solution here is pretty good. It's making two errors. On the other hand, This solution is also pretty good. Uh, it's making two errors. Uh, but in parameter space, if you remember my first solution, in parameter space, they are quite far apart. Huh? They have quite a different angle. So uh, as I try and interpolate between my one solution and the other one, you know, let's try and interpolate. Like, uh, what's a good interpolation? Maybe like so. Um, here in between, I'm actually making three errors. So I have two errors, three errors, two errors. So it means I have, as the header here says, I have local minima. So how do we deal with uh, these local minima? How can we eliminate the local minima? And I want to come back to this point that uh, this loss surface is a sum of contributions. We have one contribution from each training observation. So my the entire loss function, the one that you've seen, you know, that you've seen here in the sphere, or the one that you've seen here, these entire loss functions are all sum of heavy sidestep functions or of whatever function I'm deciding to use here. So, so far we have three choices. We have the heavy side, we have the sigmoid, and we have the hinge <coughs> function. Um, so if we use the heavy side, we have these local optima can arise. Can you make an argument of, you know, given between these three choices here, which one would best solve this problem of local optima? Yes, please. Yes. Yeah, that is not discrete, but a continuous value, which gives you the possibility to determine what is the best uh, solution. Okay, I think that that makes sense as a qualitative argument. Let's see if we can have a more mathematical argument. But I think what you are saying is right. Yeah. Yes, please. Exactly, yeah. That's the crucial point. Um, this loss surface, if we consider the one, this sum of displaced heavy side step functions, piecewise constant in form of gradient, ambiguous local optima, and it is non-convex. 
if we use the heavy side step function. And if we do use the hinge function, you're completely correct. The hinge function is convex. Uh, sum of convex functions is convex, and hence the overall loss surface is convex. And that means we will always find the global optimum. So what does this convexity uh, mean? As a reminder, um, uh, convexity means that we must always be able, in a convex function, you know, that's now my, uh, my non-formal definition. Um, if we uh, put an observer anywhere on a function, If the function has, you know, if the function has more than one minimum, then anyway, I already know it's it's not uh, convex. Um, but even if it has a single optimum, I must be able to see that optimum from wherever I am. Yeah? So the hinge function, for example, it has this extended optimum. Yeah, it's zero all around there. But if I put my observer here, then if the observer tries to look at this, uh, let's say, at, at this point, which is part of the minimum. Um, then the observer's uh, line of sight is being blocked by the heavy side step function. And uh, so this is not convex. Um, similarly, you know, for the sigmoid, if I put my observer sufficiently far on the left hand side, and if I make the observer sufficiently small, and if I now uh, you know, try and let the observer look, let's say, at this point here, then again the observer's line of sight is blocked by that function. So it's not convex. Um, but on the hinge function here, my observer is able to see any other point on the function without its line of sight being blocked. Yeah, so it can see any part of the function, hence it can always see the minimum. And uh, if we take a sum over such convex functions, the result is also convex. So we have um, local optima, um, but if we choose a convex, let's say, error count such as the hinge function then the overall error or loss surface is convex a convex function can still have an ambiguous optimum. Yeah? So it's still possible that the optimum itself in parameter space here in W uh, has some finite width, um, but it will always be possible to find that optimum. <clears throat> and at least one point on the global optimum Can always be found efficiently. And by the way, if we do use the hinge function, so this has been uh, popular in this perceptron literature. But it has also been really popular in the in the late 90s, early 2000s, um, in the so-called support vector machine. Uh, the support vector machine also uses this hinge uh, loss surrogate function, and hence gives us a convex optimization problem <clears throat> um, that, that can be solved uh, globally optimally. So this hinge function has 
has been popular in perceptron training also. So training means that we are trying to find the set of parameters W which minimize our loss surface. And now instead of this heavy side step function, we're going to use this hinge function. And now, actually in this perceptual literature in the 60s, it was the so-called central hinge function that has been used. So the central hinge function uh, has no margin. So it looks like this. If I put yi xi transpose w on this axis here, and I put my hinge function, I'm calling it here h of x on that axis, then it simply says I incur an error when I'm on the wrong side. And then it took 30 years until people realized it was a really good idea to uh, actually you know, displace this a little bit and use a finite margin here. But now I'm giving you the 1960s formula. Okay? Uh, so the 1960s formula would be that we write out this uh, minus y i x i transpose w plus. So plus means I'm only counting the positive uh, contributions here. And if I want to account for a margin, <coughs> I need to think, is it a plus or a minus? a minus? I think it's, I think a minus is correct, yeah? Uh, where this margin should be, uh, you know, some value that I choose, <laughs> uh, which is uh, bigger than zero, okay? So the black equation was 1960s, and uh, the extra term, the green term here, which is just a constant, that's the late 1990s. Yeah? Um, it's a little sad that it took so long. <laughs> also because, you know, in the, in the late 1990s, when people would optimize support vector machines, they would do this in the so-called dual space and, you know, do this in a fancy way. And then in the early 2000s, they would just do it by gradient descent. Yes? So you think you say I have the wrong sign after all, which is quite possible. Because the argument earlier was that you have the negative sign in the uh, heavy side function. But the argument on the uh, right is uh, y x i. Yes, I think you're right after all. My right? <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> so there's a reason why it took 30 years, yeah? Good. All right, uh, there are many ways uh, to write this uh, same formula. So another way to write it is to say that I have a summation over the maximum of minus yi xi transpose w plus margin comma zero. 
it's just another way of, of rewriting the same thing. Yeah? Or we could write it as, uh, we can call this a hinge function with a margin m. Yeah? We can say this is a 1 to n, the hinge that has some margin, y i x i transpose w. This time I'm, I've omitted the minus here because I can define this hinge whatever I want it to be. Um, and this entire thing here, as you said, is a sum of convex functions. So it is convex. And that means the Global optimum can be found efficiently. All right, and in this early perceptual literature, there was still quite a bit of, of confusion. Uh, because on the one hand, people defined this error function in terms of uh, sum of uh, heavy side functions, but then to optimize it, they did something different, and uh, it took a few years to clarify all of that. And well, nowadays, one would start really from defining the loss function or the error surface and then doing gradient descent on that. Um, however, um, single perceptrons, as we've seen, are a bit limited. Um, we want to go, we want to be able to have nonlinear decision boundaries in order to deal with uh, training sets such as this one here. And uh, we'll now have a 10 minute break and after uh, the break will see how to go nonlinear by, by stacking these.